Good morning, Lilydale Church. It's good to be with you all this morning. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who's participated in this morning's church service. Uh, Rosie, I love that story. It was just gold. Everybody here loved it. There's hope for somebody with coffee-colored skin and brown eyes. I love it. <laughs> but anyway, it's uh, it's good to be alive. It's a beautiful day. I've got this morning's message. I want to welcome all of you who are visiting with us and all of our regular viewers. It's good to be with you. And as Darren mentioned, uh, this is our second to last message in our series in Acts. It's been long, but I have enjoyed it so much. Today, we're going to look at Paul's final trip to uh, Rome. And I've entitled this message, Influence and Power. It's an interesting title for a sermon, but when you look at Paul in this particular uh, journey, he is not preaching large sermons like we've come to uh, be accustomed to him doing. In fact, he's going to have an impact for the kingdom through his quiet influence. And I think there's a powerful statement there for you and I to be similarly, uh, to be similar is throughout the course of our life. Now, by way of introduction, um, you know, I've been thinking over the last few months, um, this year I was meant to go travel into state and I always love an opportunity to go into state. I love to travel and um, I'm just looking forward to a time where we can travel again. And it got me thinking about travel when I was a kid. And I've got a slide for you. It's a picture of airplanes back in the day. I, surprisingly, I couldn't find too many pictures, but this is an old airplane. Uh, you can tell. Um, but for those of you at home who have no idea what you're looking at, there is a, there's like a picture in the at the very front end of the cabin. And uh, back in the day, that used to be a little cinema screen and there was a projector on it. And uh, the movie of the on the film would be thrown onto there or television shows. Um, but the thing I often liked watching, and this was my, my little quirk as a kid, but I've always loved maps. And I used to love seeing the picture of the plane and its journey and where it was going, how long it was going to take to get there. Now things have changed and we have these. This is what the modern, um, you know, airplane looks like. We've got inter inf information systems, entertainment systems, sorry, in the back of every seat. And, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want. Doesn't matter what mum's watching or what dad's watching. You know, you can watch your cartoons or your movies and anything in between. What I love to do though is I still love to go to the little channel where it has all of the information about the trip. And i um, just gonna show you a little picture of what I'm talking about here. For those of you who don't know, here's, here's what I'm talking about. You got a plane, it's left Madrid in Spain. It's heading to Chicago. This is not a trip that I've done, just what I found online. Um, and you see the little plane and you get a sense of how far you've come and how far is left, left to go. But with these um, modern systems, you can find out the wind speed outside. You can find out what the time is in your destination. Um, you can find out what the temperature is going to be. And I love, love, love it. About two hours before the end of the trip, you know, I'll usually start to fill out the custom forms if we're overseas and make sure everything's ready and start to pack all of the things back into the bags. But I have to say the last overseas trip we did was with Harry and we took him to North America and that was a long flight. <laughs> that was really long. And I found I kept going back to that little map to just find out when are we going to land? When are we going to land? How long is it going to be? And Harry wasn't the only little two-year-old at the front of the plane with us. There were about four other families and that was just crying and it was just not fun and families who were told they were going to have these seats. It just was not pleasant. And so, you know, I think it's about a 14, 15 hour flight. Um, you know, we just couldn't wait for this thing to be over. But friends, by comparison, the journey that Paul takes in today's message, uh, let's just have a look at the map. To, to cover this distance, and you see all of the little arrows, it shows you where he goes. He starts his, his uh, journey in the province of Judea in the Roman Empire to get to Rome. Now, I've traveled this area in the world, and it takes only about two hours to do a flight, even less to do from Rome to, to uh, say, Tel Aviv today. This trip that we're looking, this journey that's on your, your screens right here, would have ta takes Paul over three months in the harshest conditions known to man. 
and it just makes me appreciate the the technology we have today and how we're able to travel and friends we're going to look at paul's final trip and it's unlike any other trip it's a trip that is going to involve many hardships and just from the outset i have to share with you you get a strong sense that somebody doesn't want paul to get to his destination it's not implicit in this text, but it's sort of, you're sort of seeing it at every turn. There's something that's slowing him down. Friends, I really think, you know, 2020 hasn't been a great year. And we often, there's a saying talking about weathering the storms of life. And 2020 has definitely thrown a prolonged storm. And I really think by diving into this message, this, these chapters in chapter 27 and 28, we can have an appreciation of how we can weather life storms as Paul did in a literal sense. So we're going to start and we're going to, if you have your Bibles, we're going to read in verse one of chapter 27. And it goes like this. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who commanded the Augustinian cohort. We boarded a ship from uh, uh, Adramidium that was about to sail to the ports along the coast of the province of Asia. We put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. So in these first few verses, we are setting the table. We are setting the table for who is coming on this journey. On this journey, we obviously have Paul. He is going to Rome. He wants to make his case to the emperor. We also have Julius. Julius is going to be very important in this story. And I want you to look at this story from Julius's perspective. What does Julius see a Christian as being? What does Julius understand a Christian to be based on the actions of Paul? Not only do we have Julius, but we also have the accompanying soldiers that will escort Julius um, and Paul, okay? Um, we also have a man called Aristarchus. And not a lot is mentioned about Aristarchus in the book of Acts. We just see him as being a person from time to time who's there to support um, Paul. Colossians 4 verse 10, Philemon uh, verse 24. We are told in these letters that Aristarchus would continue to be uh, a, a support to Paul through his time in Rome. And this is not the major point of the message, friends, but I think there's something to be said about Christians having community, even through the hardest of times. And I wonder what Paul's final years of life would have been like had Aristarchus not been there. And so here we're introduced to all of the people. And we also have Luke. Luke is going to be on board and he is going to give us a stellar um, description of everything that takes place. So we pick up our story in verse three and in verse three, it says the next day we put in at Sidon and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go visit his friends to be cared for. So right now what we see is um, the ship had set sail. It's left. It's, it's moving north through Judea. It, it makes its first stop at a town um, and there, Julius is kind enough to let Paul hang out with some friends. And you have to ask yourself the question, why is he letting Paul do this? Is it because he's witnessed Paul's amazing character? I don't think that is the answer yet in the story. My belief is maybe perhaps it has something to do with the fact that Paul is a Roman citizen and Julius being a centurion would be the only other centurion on our uh, century and the only other Roman on this journey. But we're going to see as the story develops that this relationship between Julius and Paul, I think it's going to evolve. It's going to take a new flavor. And so they start to head north after this brief break in, um, in this little city of Sidon. And we're told that things don't go according to plan in verse four and five. We're told that the winds were contrary to what the captain is hoping for. And this starts to give you a flavor, a sense of things to come. As I mentioned, at every point along this journey, there is going to be some kind of problem that Paul and his uh, ship will encounter. 
they do eventually make it to where they're headed and they get to in verse six the city of myra in asia and it says there the centurion found a ship from alexandria bound for italy and put us on board the ship this is a nice little interesting detail and i thought i'd put it in there this is a nice little trivia thing but most likely the ship that they're on is a is a trade vessel and this is a well-worn trade route that Paul and his companions are on. Now, I was trying to find a picture of one of these ships, but I couldn't find one for you. But friends, think the ancient equivalent of a modern freighter. These boats were nothing to, you know, to sneeze at. These boats, according to my research, could hold 350 tons of grains. Egypt, because of the River Nile, was one of the largest, if not the largest producer of grain in the Roman Empire. And Rome had a taste for grain. And so they would have ships going up and down, up and down on this journey to deliver the goods. And so Julius decides to put his, um, his prisoners and the people in his care onto this ship. Um, one thing I also forgot to mention on this ship are other prisoners. And the other prisoners, I should have mentioned this earlier, the other prisoners are not like Paul. These prisoners are most likely headed to Rome to enter into the gladi gladiator ring. These are enemies of the state. So that hopefully fills out. That's a little tidbit I forgot to mention. But so they head on from Turkey, from, from the city of Myra, and they, 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 they start to journey across the Mediterranean, hoping to get to the island of Crete. And what we're told is, is that once again, things don't go according to plan the wind stops blowing then they're, they're just dead in the water and much time is lost and you need to have in the back of your mind as we're going through this journey that time is money for the captain and the owner of the boat it is you know important that they get to rome with the goods because then they can sell it then they can make up their costs and so sitting in the water is not good for business so they're dead in the water for, for much time. And friends, it sort of got me thinking. I don't think Luke wants us to allegorize this particular chapter. But I do think there are life lessons to be learned through this journey that Paul takes. And one of the lessons that I gleaned from this story at this point is that maybe just like the captain and the owner of the ship, we want to rush through life at a pace that God does not want us to move through. And friends, I've got this little point for you, but Christians need to learn to move at the pace of grace. So often we want to move faster than God is moving. So often we want to rush ahead to the blessings that he has for us, all the while missing out on the character development, on the growth and on the learning that he has for us on the journey. It makes me think of my time at Avondale. I was at Avondale for too long. A theology degree takes four years and I was at college for six years. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the whys, but I did two degrees and I was there for a really long time. And by the end of it, I'm like, God, I just want to get out of here. I want to start working. I want to start doing things. But those two extra years I spent learning to be a high school teacher, learning pedagogy, learning how to teach, learning how to craft a unit of work, learning how to stand up in front of a classroom and present. Those things uh, taught, well, th that time taught me things that I can, that, you know, in the moment I just thought was a waste of time. But when I look back, I see how God was working. And so friends, maybe we need to learn to move at God's pace, the pace of grace. So, you know, they eventually get to the island of Crete and in verse 10 and 11, Paul starts to make an assessment of the situation as he sees it. And he says, men, I see that the voyage will bring disaster and heavy loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also all of our lives. But the centurion listened to the advice of the captain and the owner of the ship rather than to Paul's words. So here's an interesting situation. And I've always kind of wondered about this detail but, you know, they're on the ship, they see the island of Crete, they're going past and a decision needs to be made. Are we going to, uh, you know, moor our boat in this little um, port 
And the port was called um, Fair Havens in the modern English that we have today. Um, and Paul starts to give some advice. And I wonder, how is Paul able to give advice in this season? And it seems to me that Paul gives the advice, um, his, his advice is heard, I should say, on the basis of his Roman citizenship. I've mentioned it already, but this citizenship is really important and it counts for a lot. Other than the centurion, Paul is the, over, the only other Roman citizen and that means you get a seat at the table. The other reason why I think Paul's advice is important is because Paul is well-traveled. Paul has wisdom. Paul has learned through experience what the ocean is like at this time of year. And the sailors of the ship also know what it's like. But Paul's motivation is different to the motivation of the captain and the owner of the ship. Paul's motivation are the lives on board this vessel. And that's really important. As I mentioned, one group is being motivated by economic factors. Another group is being motivated by people's lives. And so our journey continues and we're going to cover a little bit of passage here just by way of explanation. But they decide to move a little bit further up the island of Crete to the city of Phoenix in hopes that there they'll be better positioned to continue after the bad winter weather. There's a season for traveling in in the Mediterranean and it's coming to an end. And they thought if we can just position ourselves a little bit further up, we're going to be OK. But what ends up happening is a wild wind called a northeaster takes hold of the ship and it just lets them loose into the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And it's so bad that they have to start throwing over uh, cargo. They have to start throwing over tack, the, the tools that were used to sail the ship. Things are getting pretty precarious. They're getting from bad to worse. And so verse 20 just paints it beautifully. It says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and rather bad weather pressed upon us, we finally gave up all hopes of being saved. Man, <laughs> that's going to be some bad sea. And I've been on boats. And for those of you who have been on boats, you know that traveling by water, it's not always a pleasant thing. But oh, I, I can only imagine you have not seen the sunshine for many days. It's that stormy. It's that windy. And, you know, the idea that's being presented here is that some of your Bibles may not say um, we gave all hope of being saved, but the Greek here is really pointing to the idea that they thought their lives would be lost. They thought they, when they missed the island of Crete, they thought, you know what, it's all gone. Let's just hope for the best. But the reality is, the probability is we're more likely going to die than not. This is the situation they find themselves in. So at this point, Paul speaks up in verse 21 and he, uh, oh, missing a verse, but that's all right. Um, all right. I've got a slide here for you. That's okay. Here's a little picture. It's by the Dutch master Rembrandt. And um, it's a famous picture of his. It was actually stolen and it hasn't been recovered. But this is a picture of him. And this is actually another story from the Bible. But this is the disciples in the Sea of Galilee with Jesus. And you know what, friends, what's interesting is that was the only picture he ever painted on the ocean. And for a first time, he does a pretty good job, in my opinion. But what I love about the picture is that it captures so beautifully the hopelessness at sea. And, you know, this is on some smaller level in a little fishing boat. You can only imagine looking at this picture, what it must have been like to be in the Mediterranean with no hope of survival. And it needs to be noted here. Luke is not going to paint Paul as a religious superstar kind of figure like, like the Gospels do Jesus. In this story, what we see is Luke is your comrade in arms. Luke is the person who sojourns with you. And so in verse 21, this is what we want to get to over here. It says, since almost nobody wanted to eat, Paul stood up among them and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice and not have sailed from Crete and thereby avoided this damage and loss. Paul is concerned for the lives of the people in his care. You know, and I, I get it. Look, they're, they're, they're at sea. They don't want to eat. It's just not nice. And he says, guys, you really should have listened to me. 
And it can also, it can come across that Paul is rubbing it in. I knew what I was saying. You should have told me. But what I think Paul is going to do here is I think he's demonstrating his credibility. He's saying, hey guys, I am a person who can be trusted. You can trust my word. I'm not just making things up. And so friends, I really wanted you to think, but through this situation, but your voice matters. Paul was a prisoner in this environment. Yes, he had Roman uh, uh, citizenship. He could, he could, his voice would have been listened to. But I find in life so often, for, uh, for if you're an underling in your work environment, if you're not in management, if you're not in charge, whether it be at church, in your family, um, in your school, often for those of us who are not in positions of power, authority, responsibility, we are inclined to hold on to our words. Even though we may have information that people, others don't have, even though we may have received in a supernatural way information from God, I don't know. But your voice matters and your opinion matters. And Paul wants us to see that, I think. No matter what the circumstances, it's worth you sharing what you know. He says with this, you know, with this in mind in verse 22, I now urge you to be confident because not a single one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be a loss. So Paul then goes on to give some good news, some gospel, quite literally. He says, you know what? Things are going to be okay. I am confident. And the question I asked myself, was, what is the source of Paul's confidence? What is the source of his surety? And friends, I really think it is that Paul is a person of prayer. We're actually not told that he prays, but there seems to be a little bit of a clue that indicates that Paul knows something. Maybe he's had an answer to prayer. In verse 23 and verse 24, it says, For last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me and said, do not be afraid. You must stand trial before the emperor. And indeed, God has graciously given you the lives of all who are sailing with you. The source of Paul's surety comes from the God to which he belongs. Friends, you have a God to whom you belong. You have something else that you know, the rest of society wished they had. They don't, they may not know it, but you have something so valuable. I love how Paul says, God has graciously given the lives of all who are sailing with you. And I think that gives us a little bit of to clue that maybe this is an answer to prayer. Whilst, you know, if I could say this, while all hell is breaking loose on this boat, you know, Paul is praying. Paul is asking God, there are people in, in my care, there are people you've placed in my environment. You need to get us through this. They don't know who you are. They need to come to a truth that you have sent your son into the world to save them. And so I really think that Paul, Paul models for us what it means to be a Christian who weathers the storm. You're not just thinking about yourself, but you're thinking of the lives of others. And so the story continues, but things get even more worse. They end up in this tempest for 14 days. It's so bad that the crew decide to abandon ship. There's a little dinghy, a life raft that gets towed at the back of the boat, and they decide to hop into it. And Paul says to Julius, Julius, if these guys hop into the boat, the rest of us, we're just dead in the water. None of us know how to sail. None of us know anything about, you know, how to manage this. We need these guys. So Julius and his soldiers, they get the boat, they get everybody back on board and they do this crazy thing, but they cut loose the boat. They let it adrift into the middle of the ocean. And basically they sever any hopes of getting off the boat intact. The boat will have to beach itself, will have to crash because they've let go of so many of the tools needed to steer and guide a ship. And so Paul is, um, yeah, gives this advice. Julius listens. And what you see in this story over the course of these verses is that Paul has given a lot of advice. 
He said, stay on the island. He's told people to stay hopeful. He's told people to stay on the boat. And next, what we see him do is tell people to stay healthy. Again, Paul has the best interest of everybody on board. And Paul does this really interesting thing. He takes some bread, he he prays over it, he asks for a blessing, and he eats it, and he encourages others to do likewise. And some people have said there's a beautiful little picture of communion there. And I'm not sure some scholars have argued, debate that, but I like to believe it's true, that Paul could give thanks for what Jesus had done, no matter the circumstance. But here's the cool thing. In verse 36, it says, all of them, all of the other passengers on board were encouraged and they themselves also took food. Paul has this beautiful way of encouraging everybody in this of worst situations. The other little detail Luke includes here, which I think is really important, is a very short verse. In verse 37, it says, we were 276 persons on board. And I think now you start to see what is motivating so many of Paul's decisions. It's not just concern for self, the, the, to stay on the island, to be hopeful, to, to stay on the boat, to be strong, to be healthy. All of that is being motivated by these 276 people on the ship. And so, friends, I really want to ask you the question, how do you imagine Paul interacting with these passengers? How did Paul during this season, you know, he's praying, I think, but I suspect that Paul would have been visiting all of these people, being encouraging, being helpful, you know, making sure that the spirit stays strong in these people to not give up hope. And I definitely think that there is an application for all of us here to do similar in this situation we find ourselves in. We too are to be people who bring hope to life's worst situations. And so we continue our story. Um, and in verse four, we see that they finally get to the island of Malta. Things have been worse. They've cut the anchors loose. They've spotted an island and they get onto this island. It says when the natives saw a creature, there's a snake hanging from Paul's arms. They said to each other, this man must be a murderer. Because even though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. So they've made it to this island. And like I said, Paul's journey is just incredible. He, this, this pastor's heart, which Paul has, he's caring for people. They get onto the island. He decides to collect driftwood and help make a fire. The Maltese are very friendly. And then a snake comes out and bites and attaches to his arm. And these good-natured Maltese, which the Bible tells us, they actually think this guy must be really bad. And it seems that Paul can read between the lines and he just shakes the snake off into the fire and carries on like nothing happened. And you get the sense that these people must have been so baffled. They must have been so awestruck by this guy. They actually think he's a god. Truth is, he's not. We know who Paul is. But Paul won't actually tell them he's not like he has in other parts of the Bible. He is going to let his actions speak louder than his words here. And so Paul and the soldiers and everybody else, they stay on this island for a little over three months and Paul comes to shine. Um, it turns out that the, uh, the, the, the ruler of the island is a really lovely guy, Publius, and his father gets ill. Paul comes over, prays over him and he's healed and the rest of the island hears and they bring all of their sick and Paul continues to pray and there's many healings. And this mighty work for God is done in these three months that they're on the island of Malta. And it's this really beautiful little detail of the story. Interesting little fact, we had Maltese neighbors and they told us that there are more Maltese people in Melbourne than there are in Malta. How incredible is that? But anyway, so the story continues. They eventually get off the island of Malta and the Maltese just love Paul and what he's done so much so that they just give them all the, the things they they need to make it to, to Rome. So they head to Rome. This is the last leg. And it's a really beautiful picture here. Along the way, word gets out that Paul is coming. And I wonder if Julius had done this route before. He's not used to any particular fanfare. You know, maybe people were spitting and, you know, cussing out these prisoners, enemies of the state. But Julius sees something different as they go from place to place. 
Paul is greeted with this overwhelming demonstration of love. Verse 15 is the last um, demonstration of that. And I thought I'd share it with you. It says, the believers there had heard that he was coming and they came as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. This is just outside of Rome. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. And this is kind of where we finish before our final uh, look into Acts next week. But friends, as I said to you at the beginning of this message, let's look at this story from the perspective of Julius. Let's look at this story from the perspective of the prisoners that were with him and of the soldiers. What have they seen? What have they learned? What does it mean to be a Christian? That's the question. What is Paul's legacy on his travel companions? Well, here's what they've seen. They've seen somebody who cares. They've seen somebody who is generous. They've seen somebody who has great wisdom in the face of danger. They've seen someone who has divine favor, favor with the gods. They've seen someone who is beloved by his community and can develop love in a community that is complete strangers to him. They've seen somebody, I believe, they want to be like. We don't know what happens to Julius beyond this story. Um, church tradition has a few ideas, but I didn't want to include it because it's, it's a lot of conjecture there. But friends, I really like to believe that these, you know, three plus months Paul spends at sea had a profound impact. As Paul went through this most ferocious of storms, he had an impact on his travel companions. Friends, we have been in a storm of sorts. What has your impact been? What has your legacy been on the people in your life, in the people in your workplace, in your family, in your community? Friends, I believe the Bible tells us things are going to get progressively worse before Jesus comes back. There will be more storms. But what that tells me, friends, is that there will be more opportunities for new poles to arrive. People who are going to be level-headed in the face of, you know, unforeseen you know difficulties and unforeseen problems it's just going to get worse but faith in God makes the difference Paul as we have said is a man who has influence and power in spite of the circumstances he found himself you would think that Paul was powerless and so friends right now I want to pray over our church that everybody listening can be a person of influence in spite of the power they feel they may not have, that we can continue to be influential for God no matter the circumstances. So bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I just wanted to say thank you for this final journey that we've seen Paul take. It's not a journey where he preaches amazing sermons. It's not a journey where he we see you know, a lots of crazy riots in cities and, you know, Paul, you know, stirring up a, a big mess that, that he's accustomed to doing. No, we just see Paul on a journey. We just see him being yourself. We see him leaning into relationship. We see him being a person that can be trusted, that can be admired, a person that encourages. And Jesus, I want to pray that we can glean something of these qualities in our own lives as individuals and corporately as a church. We don't know what the future holds for the city of Melbourne, for Australia and for the world. But my firm belief is, Heavenly Father, that you are inviting us to become more like Paul. As we see the world, I believe, you know, it's, things are slowly starting to wrap up. We don't know when things are going to end, but Father, you are coming soon. You're sending Jesus to bring us home and you want us to bring as many people with us. And so, Father, my prayer is that we can be a church that looks like Paul. Bless us to this end. Thank you for giving us these beautiful stories. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus. And we pray this prayer in his wonderful and precious name. Amen. Thank you, church. It's been great. And as always, look forward to seeing you. God bless.